Hello, I'm Chris Flanagan. I'm a consultant paediatric intensivist, and I'm going to be continuing on with this case from where Ben left off. So we reached a critical point where we need to decide if we should intubate this patient or not. And to help us make up our mind, I want to take a look at the indications for intubating an asthmatic. Now this is life-threatening features which are refractory to maximum treatment. And you can see the life-threatening features over to the right-hand side of the screen according to the BTS guidelines. So importantly, it is life-threatening features are refractory to maximum treatment because we will get a lot of children presenting to the emergency department with life-threatening features. But give them some steroids and three back-to-back -back nebulizers and the majority of them will get better without needing intubation. It is also important to remember that we do occasionally get patients presenting in extremis and it wouldn't be right to delay intubation to work through maximum treatment options before deciding to intubate them. When it comes to intubating asthmatics, I've got two main rules. The first is that you shouldn't do it unless you really have to. And the second is for the patient in extremis, you shouldn't delay intubation. Now, I know some of you are probably raising your eyebrows at that second rule as who isn't going to intubate the patient in extremis. But once we look at the first rule and you understand the reasons behind that and the human factors involved, the reason for the second rule will become clear. So taking a look at the first rule, which is don't intubate the asthmatic unless you have to. The main reason behind this is actually there's a very real risk of the patient dying during your intubation attempt. And for asthmatics in hospital, the most likely time for them to arrest is immediately on intubation or the few minutes following intubation. And in fact, by the time they reach the intensive care unit, their risk of death is relatively low. So that in itself is a big reason not to do it unless you have to. There are other problems. Um, the first thing is that you putting the endotracheal tube in the trachea does absolutely nothing to reverse the disease process because this is all happening below the level of the trachea. As well, by intubating the patient, you're introducing a whole host of new problems. Air trapping is a big issue and it's one of the common reasons these patients arrest and we'll talk about this more as we go along. These patients are often frequently difficult to oxygenate and ventilate. And you're going to have to use much higher pressures to do that than what you're comfortable with, putting the patient at risk of pneumothoraces and air leaks. If I intubate an asthmatic, I know that I'm in for a really tough shift. I'm not going to be able to leave them. They're going to try and die multiple times on me, and I'm going to have to intervene. So in reality, you should not be doing this unless you really have to. And if you're intubating the patient who's on 40% oxygen on some high flow because their SATs are 92%, you don't know what you're doing and you haven't looked after an intubated and ventilated asthmatic. So now that you understand the reasons for the first rule, the reasons that the second rule exists should be clear. The fact that this patient is at risk of dying during an intubation attempt, people who have the insight to understand this will obviously try and avoid it if at all possible. And we need to recognise that we're going to have this instinct. And the patient who presents in extremis, there will initially be a natural reaction to try and avoid intubating them. But for that asthmatic who is very clearly over the hill and on that slippery slope towards death, you need to intervene in a timely manner and not unnecessarily put the intubation process off. So taking a look at our patient, our patient very clearly has life-threatening features that are refractory to maximum treatment. We have worked our way through the algorithm and exhausted all treatment options. So it is clear that our patient is going to require intubation and ventilation. The next thing I want to do is take a look at the reasons why an asthmatic will unrest on induction of anesthesia so that we can come up with a treatment plan of how we're going to get our patient intubated safely. So by far the most common reason for the asthmatic to arrest in that peri-intubation period is air trapping. So if you haven't heard of air trapping before, don't worry, I'll explain exactly what it is. So I'm sure most of you have looked after asthmatics and what you'll notice when you look after an asthmatic is they don't tend to have problems getting air into their lungs, but they struggle to get it out. And when you listen to an asthmatic, you'll notice they've got prolongation of their expiratory phase. It takes them a very long time to empty their lungs. And that isn't a big problem for them when they're breathing spontaneously because they'll wait until they've finished expiring before taking the next breath. Where it becomes a problem is when we intervene and put them on a ventilator. And if we haven't set the ventilator up properly, what will happen before they have finished expiring, another breath will be given. 
And if that cycle repeats itself time and time again, with each breath, more and more air is retained in the lungs, resulting in the lungs becoming more and more distended with each breath. And that has a very similar effect to a tension pneumothorax. The increased intrathoracic pressure impairs the venous return coming back to the heart. The patient will become hypotensive, bradycardic, and unless you intervene appropriately, will arrest. And importantly, if you manage the cardiac arrest, just like any other cardiac arrest, you will never get this patient back. So we are going to talk about the detection, prevention, and treatment of this later on in the talk. Another common reason these patients arrest is in pneumothorax. And you have to think, how are you going to pick this up in that peri-intubation period? And if you're saying, wait for a chest x-ray, which is going to take 10 or 15 minutes, that is obviously going to be too slow. So for me, there is really only one way to pick these up in a reliable manner, and that is with ultrasound. Within a matter of seconds, you'll know whether your patient's deterioration is related to a pneumothorax or not. So if I'm going to intubate an asthmatic, one of the things I'm going to want in place before I start is the ultrasound been brought to the room. So should our patient deteriorate, we can either rule in or rule out a pneumothorax very quickly. The other thing, should you find a pneumothorax, you're going to want to treat it. And the first action is going to be to needle the chest with a large bore cannula. And again, be careful where you are in the hospital, because if you're in a paediatric area, quite often you might only find 24 and 22 gauge cannulas, which are going to be far too small for our eight-year-old. So again, a bit of preparation is going to be needed. If you're going to be intubating and ventilating the patient, you're going to make, want to make sure you've got large enough cannula to decompress any tension pneumothorax. The other important thing to remember, and I've seen this numerous times over my career, is just because you have needled a tension pneumothorax does not mean you have relieved the tension. Um, when you actually put the chest strain in, quite often you will get a sudden hiss and release of tension and sudden improvement in the patient who actually has a cannula which has been held by somebody making sure it's not kinked in place. And I've seen this a number of times where a cannula in a tension pneumothorax has not relieved the tension. So you are going to want to follow up that needle decompression with chest tube insertion in a relatively timely manner. And again, depending on where you are in your hospital, do you have appropriately sized paediatric chest strains available? So these are some of the things you may want to find out about in advance before you start, because when you have developed a pneumothorax is not the time to go looking for these things. The final thing is you might not actually be able to oxygenate and ventilate your patient any better with the endotracheal tube in place than what you could beforehand. And the big reason for this is, the, as we've mentioned, the disease process is happening below the endotracheal tube, and putting the tube in does nothing to alter that disease process. It just treats respiratory failure. Okay, so now we've had a look at the main reasons our patient is likely to deteriorate with intubation. I want to use this to help us come up with a plan for intubating our particular patient. I think the first thing we need to do is discuss with either the paediatric intensive care team or the transport team, depending on what the arrangements are in your local area. And the reasons for this are, first of all, um, although our patient obviously does need intubated, the asthmatic that you're referring may not actually need intubated. And by picking up the phone and speaking to us, we may well be able to suggest some steps that you can take and actually turn your patient around. And if you turn them around, the risk of death is significantly lower. The other thing is, is say your patient does need intubated and we agree with you, knowing that um, going into that risky scenario of intubating them is going to give you some backup that you have no choice into doing this. As well, we're going to be able to discuss and agree the plan with you so that you're going to be doing this in the safest possible manner. The next thing that I think is really important is a good team brief. Because as we've mentioned, most people will not understand the very real risk of this child dying during the intubation attempt. So if you start allocating rules for cardiac arrest during intubation and asking for resuscitation drugs to be prepared, I find this really focuses everybody's attention in the room and just how serious the situation actually is. As we've mentioned, air trapping is probably the most likely reason your patient is going to arrest in this particular period, and preventing it is much better than curing it. So the common reason it happens is because you haven't let the patient expire before giving the next breath. And from a human factor's point of view, you have to recognize that your own adrenaline as the intubator is going to be sky high, 
This is a really sick patient, a really stressful scenario, and your own natural instinct is going to bag this patient faster and harder than what you need to. So when I'm intubating one of these patients, I will tell somebody else in the team, I want you to remind me after I put the tube down to bag the child slowly, watch their chest, making sure they're finished expiring before I give the next breath. And you can't rely on yourself to remember that. You need to raise that up with the team so that others can remind you to do that. The other important thing to remember about these patients is they are highly likely to desaturate on intubation. And again, your natural response to a desaturated intubated patient is to bag harder and faster to try and bring the sats up. And this will have the opposite effect in these patients. The other important thing to remember with air trapping, if it's likely to occur, you can help lessen the effect it has on the cardiovascular system by filling up the system. So for most patients I'm intubating, I will give them 10 to 20 mils per kilo as a fluid bolus to try and increase their preload. So should there be any increased intrathoracic pressure, and there almost certainly is going to be with the high pressures we're going to need to ventilate these patients with, it's going to have less of an effect on the cardiovascular system. The final important key point, I think, in preparing these patients for intubation is to consider inserting an arterial line prior to the induction of anesthesia. This is quite an unusual thing to do because most of the time we will put the arterial line in after the patient is asleep. But this is one particular situation where I would strongly ask you to consider doing this prior to putting the child to sleep. And the reason for this is this is by far the best way to pick up air trapping, which in general is a cardiovascular phenomenon. If you think if air trapping was to occur without an arterial line, how would you actually pick it up? Well, the first thing is your patient would become hypotensive. Your blood pressure cuff would cycle. It wouldn't give you a reading. It would try again. It wouldn't give you a reading. And I would repeat that a number of times before anybody had actually noticed. The next thing that would happen again, probably before anybody's noticed, is the patient would become bradycardic. Within a number of seconds after becoming bradycardic, the patient normally arrests. And like we've mentioned, if you don't recognise this as air trapping and intervene appropriately, you will never get this patient back. If you have the arterial line in, what you will tend to notice is the blood pressure just goes down, 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 down and disappears off the bottom of the screen. The patient then becomes bradycardic and that cycle continues on. So hopefully with the blood pressure disappearing and the monitor alarming, you will be able to intervene at that stage rather than waiting to the bradycardia. So you're more likely to prevent the patient arresting. Um, this is a bit controversial and not everybody would recommend doing it. But for me, this is one particular circumstance where I think you should do it. Um, if it's done with some local anaesthetic cream applied, then you infiltrate a little bit of local anaesthetic. The patient will not feel this. And in general, these patients have good radial arteries. If they don't, ultrasound guided femoral arterial line is very straightforward and easy to do. And in our eight-year-old, the femoral arteries are going to be absolutely massive and you'll have a harder job missing them than actually hitting them. Moving on to the technicalities of actually putting the tube in, and a question I'm often asked is, should I use a direct laryngoscope or a video laryngoscope? And my answer to this is always the same. You should use whatever tool you're most likely to succeed with on the first attempt. And this patient, is, as we've mentioned, is at very high risk of death during the intubation period. And should something go wrong, for example, should they vomit and aspirate, um, or should you not be able to get the tube in and have to resort to face mask ventilation again, this could be critical for this particular patient. So the person putting the tube in should be the person who's most likely to succeed, and they should be using whatever method they're most likely to succeed with. So they don't normally use a video laryngoscope, it's probably not the time to try out the new video laryngoscope. You want to get this tube in fast and first pass if possible. In terms of what tube you put in, um, you don't really have a choice here. You must put a cuff tube in these patients, regardless of what's done in your local area as a standard practice. We use all cuff tubes in Northern Ireland unless they're contraindicated. If you don't, this is one particular group where you should be putting a cuff tube in. Because if we come out and find a patient with an uncuffed tube in, you're going to have one very unhappy paediatric intensivist as they have to do a very difficult emergency tube change. In terms of the drugs you're going to use, um, we tend to use ketamine for intubating most critically ill children. The exception to that is, tends to be seizures, where we'll tend to use either propofol or thiopentone, providing the patient's stable enough. 
But in general, ketamine is what we use. Um, in asthmatics, ketamine does have some bronchodilatory properties, so there's absolutely no reason to go away from ketamine. You are going to want to do a modified rapid sequence induction in these patients. As we've mentioned, should they get laryngospasm, should they vomit and aspirate, it's going to be an absolute nightmare and the patient is very likely to arrest on you. So you are going to want to give them a muscle relaxant. There's only two muscle relaxants which are quick enough to do a modified rapid sequence and they are sucks or rocuronium. I'm using rocuronium all day, every day. I don't use sucks as a pediatric intensivist due to its side effect profile. But again, you should use whichever of these two drugs that you're comfortable with and are part of your normal practice. Okay, so going back to our patient, we go ahead and put a right radial ultrasound guided arterial line in under local anaesthetic without any difficulty. Um, we go ahead and give our patient 20 mils per kilo as a fluid bolus um, prior to induction of anaesthesia. We pre-oxygenate our patient following a bolus of ketamine rocuronium, one milligram per kilogram of each we carry out a modified rapid sequence induction. We have no trouble getting a grade one view with a video laryngoscope and no trouble passing the endotracheal tube. However, shortly after the tube has been passed, our patient becomes hypotensive and bradycardic. So on your screen now, you can see a list of potential treatment options for this particular patient. So what I want you to do is pick one of these options, only one of them is correct. And I want you to go over to the YouTube chat and type in what you think is the correct answer. Um, what I'll do, I'll read through the answers for those of you listening to the audio only version of this talk. So option one is remove the tube and return to face mask ventilation. We can start CPR. You can give a fluid bolus. You can give an adrenaline bolus. You can give some atropine. You can disconnect the endotracheal tube and manually decompress the chest, or you can do needle decompression of the chest. So as we've said, air trapping is by far the most common reason for these patients to arrest during intubation. And our patient is very definitely peri-arrest and unless we intervene appropriately, is likely to go into full cardiac arrest. So if you think if you have a tension pneumothorax, what you do is you relieve the tension. You put a needle or cannula into the area of tension, remove the pressure, and hopefully things will improve fairly quickly. The area of tension is actually in the lungs themselves with air trapping. We don't need to put any needles into the lungs. We've already got a large endotracheal tube going down to the lungs. So all we need to do is disconnect our patient from the bagging circuit or ventilator. And if air trapping is the cause, what you will hear is a hiss coming from the endotracheal tube as the tension relieves itself. Similar to the hiss you will hear when you needle a tension pneumothorax. That's option one. Option two is you can disconnect and actually manually compress the chest for about a second, forcing the air out the endotracheal tube. This is a little bit controversial because for that initial second that you are pressing down on the chest, you're actually increasing the interthoracic pressure. So there isn't a clear answer. Obviously, nobody's done a randomized controlled trial on this for obvious reasons as to which you should do. You can either disconnect and leave the patient alone, which is going to take a little bit longer to relieve the area of air trapping, or you can disconnect and press on the chest. I've always been a, a presser on the chest. I've never had any adverse outcomes from doing it. And I'm a believer that these patients are going to arrest in the next few seconds and I don't have time to wait. But you'll have to make your own mind up over which of the two methods you use. The important thing, as we've mentioned before, is if you manage this like any other cardiac arrest with the other treatment options on the screen, you will never get this patient back. If you start CPR, continue bagging them, don't relieve the area of air trapping and tension in the lungs, which is impairing the venous return, nothing else you do will actually bring this patient back. So the first action you need to remember in an intubated asthmatic is always to disconnect them from the endotracheal, disconnect the endotracheal tube from the ventilator or circuit, plus or minus manual decompression of the chest. Okay, so going back to our patient, we disconnect them from the bagging circuit, manually decompress the chest, and the blood pressure just appears back on the screen, and the bradycardia disappears. So we want to go ahead and reassess our patient. So from an airway point of view, we've got a five and a half cuffed endotracheal tube at 16 centimeters at the lips and we've already been down the endotracheal tube and suctioned out some secretions. In terms of breathing, we're still handbagging our patient in 100% oxygen. They do actually have a silent chest. When we listen into the chest, we can't hear any air entry or any additional sounds. SATs aren't good. They're only 79% on the 100% oxygen. 
and our bronchodilators are on change. We're on 20 mics per minute of salbutamol and one milligram per kilogram per hour of aminophilum. Go on to look at the cardiovascular system. Our numbers aren't too bad. We're a little bit tachycardic, as you would expect, being on the bronchodilators that we're on. Blood pressure is good with a MAP of 75. Cap refills two seconds. And we've had in total 30 mils per kilo of fluid as boluses. 20 mils per kilo prior to induction of anesthesia. And a further 10 mils per kilo given during the episode of our trapping. From a disability point of view, our patient is sedated, muscle relaxed, or coma scales 3. Pupils are equal and reactive, nice and brisk to light. And our BM is up at 11.7, which again isn't a surprise given the stress and the steroids that the patient has already had. Taking a look at our blood gas, and it's not good. Um, we've got a fairly severe acidosis with a pH of 6.82. Um, it's mostly respiratory with a CO2 of 18.9 kilopascals, although there is a metabolic component with a base excess of minus 9.2, which is mostly made up with the lactic acidosis with lactate at 6.4 millimoles per litre. So we've got a patient who isn't oxygenating and ventilating well, so we're going to need to carry out a dopes assessment to try and get to the bottom of the cause. Um, you can see what dopes stands for on the screen. I'm not going to go through it all again because I did do a full talk on dopes two years ago at the Waiting for the Retrieval Team Day, and you'll find a link to that lecture on the Paediatric Emergencies website. So in terms of dopes, the two main things that we need to look for are air trapping, as we already mentioned, in an asthmatic it does tend, however, to be a cardiovascular phenomenon. It's more likely to cause cardiovascular issues than issues with oxygenation and ventilation. Pneumothoraces tend to cause problems with both. Um, and as we've mentioned, the best way to pick this up is with ultrasound. So we go ahead and get our portable ultrasound and bring it to the bed space and scan the right lung. And when we look at the right lung, we can see pleural sliding, really out a pneumothorax. Go ahead and scan the left lung, and we see the same. We've got pleural siding, so we ruled out a pneumothorax fairly quickly. Ten minutes later, we get our chest x-ray, and as we were expecting, based on our ultrasound, there's no evidence of a pneumothorax. We can see our endotracheal tube is in a good position. So what do you want to do now? How are we going to get this patient turned around? We've got a patient who isn't oxygenating well, isn't ventilating well. We've been through our dopes assessment and ruled out the common causes. So on the screen you can see a list of potential treatment options that we can do at this particular stage. And again, what I want you to do is go over to the YouTube chat and pick which one of the following you would use now. And again, for those of you listening to the audio only version, I'll read through the options. So option one is an adrenaline infusion. Option two, magnesium infusion. Option three, ketamine infusion. Option four, you can increase the salbutamol infusion. Five is Heliox. 6. Volatile Anaesthetic Agent 7. Physio 8. DNAs 9. Bronchoscopy and 10. ECMO Referral So I'm going to make a start of going through these. If you've still got to get your answer in, keep it coming. But looking at the first three treatment options, these are all things I would consider doing at this stage when I've got a patient with refractory asthma. The only downside is that I don't think any of these three first treatments are likely to turn our patient round in the next five to ten minutes, which is what our patient actually needs. So an adrenaline infusion is definitely a good option to consider at this stage. Um, the beta effects are going to help with bronchodilatation. And the other important thing to remember is that actually some of these patients who have been labelled as asthmatics actually will have anaphylaxis. And if you don't give them adrenaline, you're not actually treating them. So as well as helping in refractory asthma, low-dose adrenaline infusion will actually treat the undiagnosed patient with anaphylaxis. So it would definitely be something I would want to add in at this stage, but I wouldn't think it's going to turn my patient round in the next five or ten minutes like I need it to. Similarly, a magnesium infusion is something that's worth considering at this stage. The magnesium is going to relax the smooth muscle in the airways. Um, and what we can either do is give another bolus of magnesium or start the patient on a continuous infusion, something like 30 milligrams per kilogram per hour, targeting magnesium levels somewhere between 1.5 and 2.5. And, and at those higher levels, as well as relaxing the smooth muscle in the airways, like we'd hope, it is likely to relax the smooth muscle in the vasculature. So you will tend to have to support the patient's blood pressure if you are going to go with a magnesium infusion. Ketamine infusion is another good treatment option. As we've mentioned, ketamine has bronchodilatory properties. 
you are going to have to give this patient something to keep them asleep. So it does make sense you use something that's going to actually help with the airways as well. And I would often pair ketamine with something like fentanyl for these patients. I tend not to use morphine, which we would tend to use first line because of the risk of histamine release. And that would be a similar reason if we're going to use a muscle relaxant, I wouldn't use a tracurium. Um, if the patient's sick like this, ketamine and fentanyl would be my preferred choice. If this is just a patient with wheeze, like a viral induced wheeze, who actually were not struggling to oxygenate and ventilate, I would tend to go with fentanyl and midazolam rather than ketamine. Because I find when you add ketamine to the other bronchodilators, you end up with a patient that's very tachycardic and hypertensive. And I find a combination of fentanyl and midazolam is better to treat that. This particular patient, we're trying to get every single thing that we can to improve the bronchodilatation. So I would use ketamine for this particular patient. We've got the option to increase our salbutamol infusion. And as Ben has mentioned earlier on, we don't find a great benefit with using the higher doses of salbutamol infusion. It's very rare that I'll go more than one mic per kilo per minute, sometimes up to two mics per kilo per minute. And I know the BNF does say you can go up to five mics per kilo per minute, but again, I would almost never use those doses. Um, quite often, our preconceived ideas will be wrong in the individual patient. So for most patients who I'm really struggling with, I will try and put the salbutamol up a little bit, see if it makes any difference. If it doesn't, I'll put it back down again. So it's not that I'm saying I'm definitely never going to put it up. I think you have to sometimes go against what you think is likely to work. And every now and again, you're surprised and quite happy to be wrong when your patient turns around. Heliox, um, if you're doing an exam, this is a good answer to give. Outside the exam scenario, I have never found this to be of any use. Heliox is a low density gas which turns a turbulent flow into laminar flow, so it's hopefully going to improve our moving in and out of the asthmatic's lungs. There's two main problems with it. The first is, do you know where you're going to get this in your hospital in a timely manner? Um, I certainly don't. The second reason is that once you start adding oxygen to Heliox, it loses its beneficial effect. And for our patient at 100% oxygen, it's not going to be helpful, even if you had it immediately available. Volatile anaesthetic agents, I think, are where you're actually going to get the most chance of turning this patient around in a timely manner. And again, they work on relaxing the smooth muscles in the airway. And I have used it in numerous situations like this and turned the asthmatic round in five to 10 minutes and broken the spasm. And by 20 minutes, you can either take the patient off it if you're using a portable anesthetic machine in the ICU. If you're in the operating theater, you can obviously continue on to run it. Are there certain devices you can bring into the ICU to allow you to deliver it through the ICU ventilator? But a lot of the times I've given it just for maybe 20 minutes and been able to take it away. And you've had a patient who's had a silent chest who's had a significant improvement to it. Um, the important thing to remember is that obviously we can't transfer the patient on the volatile anaesthetic agent. But again, that's not a big thing at the moment. You're, that's not your goal. Your goal is to try and oxygenate and ventilate the patient and we can worry about how we're going to transfer them later on. Like with the magnesium infusion, it's going to, as well as relaxing the smooth muscle in the airway, it's going to relax the smooth muscle in the vasculature, probably even to a bigger degree. So the chances are you are going to have to support the blood pressure with some drugs if you're going with volatile anaesthetic agents. Up until this point, really all the treatment options that we have given have been directed towards bronchospasm. But we have to remember there's three pathological processes going on in asthma. The first is bronchospasm. There's also airway inflammation for which we've given steroids, but there's increased mucus production. And particularly in a lot of patients who are labeled as viral induced wheeze, once you intubate them and actually clear their chest out, the wheeze disappears. And that's because the airways, yes, they've been narrowed and that's why the patient is wheezing, but they've been narrowed with secretions that you couldn't get before. Looking at our patient, I think this is less likely to be true, given we have a lovely clear x-ray. Um, but like I say, in other situations, this is the common cause of wheeze and you're going to get a lot more value going after them. Ways that you can go after it are chest physio. Um, obviously, this has pros and cons to doing an asthma. By actually doing chest physio, the risk of air trapping is incredibly high and the risk of causing a pneumothorax is also increased. So there's risks and benefits to what you're going to have to weigh up. Your physio might be very reluctant to actually want to treat the asthmatic, uh, 
And if you do get them to agree, you can't send them off to treat the asthmatic by themselves because they're likely to deteriorate during it. You're going to have to go with them and watch them very closely during the process. But I have had numerous asthmatics over the years who we've worked on the bronchodilators and actually where we've turned pressures of 40 on the ventilator to 25 is with a single physio session. So it is certainly something worth considering at this stage. Other options to help with the secretions are things like DNAs, um, again a word of caution that can increase bronchospasm and bronchoscopy again is another option to consider. Obviously if you have a patient you can't oxygenate or ventilate you should be thinking about making an ECMO referral in a timely manner. So going back to reassess our patient, our airway is unchanged, we're still handbagging in 100% oxygen but we've added some CO fluor in, into the circuit. That does seem to have had some benefit because from a silent chest we've now got poor entry throughout the chest and we can actually appreciate some wheeze. The SATs have improved to 93% and our bronchodilators are unchanged. From a circulatory point of view uh, things are a little bit worse, we're a bit more tachycardic at 152 beats per minute and our blood pressure has dropped to 77 over 37 with a MAP of 50. Cap refill is still 2 seconds but we've given an extra 10 mls per kilo of fluid bolus so 40 mls per kilo in total at this stage. From a D point of view things are really unchanged on clinical assessment but we have added in some fentanyl at 4 mics per kilo per hour and some ketamine at a milligram per kilogram per hour. Taking a look at our blood gas and it again is also going in the right direction with the volatile anaesthetic agent been added in. Our pH is up to 7.023, the CO2 down to 13.7 kilopascals and our base X is also improving down to minus 7.2 with decrease in our lactate to 4.4. Important, other important thing to note on the gas is potassium is slightly low at 3.2. We are currently running 20 millimoles and 500 mils in the bag but we might need to think about a central line and concentrated potassium infusion should that continue to decrease. So we now need to look at how we're going to treat the hypotension and I put a few options on the screen. First of all there's the option to reduce our sedation which doesn't seem like a great option to me. The only reason our patient has turned round is probably because of the sevoflurane although the ketamine infusion may well have helped as well. Fentanyl is obviously unlikely to have helped so there is potential to drop the fentanyl slightly but I would be very reluctant to drop the drugs that have potentially turned this patient round and would rather actually go after the blood pressure and leave these drugs running. Um, as well as I've mentioned the sevoflurane is going to have to come off when we go ahead and transfer the patient so I do think it is certainly reasonable to have the patient loaded up on other infusions so when we turn the sevo off they're not going to wake up. Further fluid bolus is another option that we have and again I don't think it is a good one as well. Um, our patients already had 40 mils per kilo which is half their circulating volume. We know the most recent they're likely hypotensive is from vasodilatation from the sevoflurane. So again filling that increased space with more fluid doesn't make sense when you could actually squeeze the space. So that gives us a choice between adrenaline and noradrenaline. Um, as we've already mentioned adrenaline has other advantages in asthma. The beta effects are potentially going to help open the airways up as well as treating the blood pressure. So it would be my first line drug to use. Um, the downside to using it is you've already got a lot of other drugs going which have beta effects and are going to increase your heart rate and our patients are already pretty tachycardic. So I wouldn't use the adrenaline at more than 0.1 mics per kilo per minute which is going to be given a good bronchodilator effect and if we need something more than that for blood pressure control I would add in some noradrenaline and use that to just control the blood pressure to where I wanted it to. So we're getting the advantages of bronchodilatation from the adrenaline but then using the norad to control the blood pressure on top of that if we need to. So I think at this stage we could probably try our patient on the ventilator. The oxygen and ventilation has improved significantly so I thought it was worth going through the settings that we would tend to use in asthmatics. In terms of mode historically we would use pressure control and the reason for that is the pressure control mode of ventilation has a decelerating flow pattern which allows you to give the same tidal volume at a lower peak pressure than a mode of ventilation which is a continuous flow pattern something like volume control. What I tend to use is PRVC because again it has a decelerating flow pattern like pressure control 
but offers all the advantages of a volume control mode of ventilation. So that would be my preferred method. In terms of ITE ratio, for most of our intensive care patients, we'll use an ITE ratio of 1 to 2. But as we've mentioned, asthmatics struggle to get air out of their lungs. So you're probably going to want to start somewhere 1 to 3 to 1 to 5. And what you want to do is look at the graph on the ventilator of flow against time. On the graph you've now got on your screen at the moment, this is the middle graph. Above the baseline you have inspiratory flow, below the baseline you have expiratory flow. And it's the expiratory flow that you're going to want to watch. You, that waveform, you're looking for it to reach the baseline before the next breath is given. If the next breath is given before the expiratory flow has reached the baseline, your patient is at risk of air trapping and you should prolong that expiratory phase by lengthening your ITE ratio to prevent the air trapping. Going on to look at the other settings, um, from a rate point of view, obviously you want to keep a relatively normal eye time, um, but a long IT ratio, so that is going to limit your respiratory rate. And for our eight-year-old, I'm probably starting somewhere around about 15 breaths per minute. In terms of peak expiratory pressure, again, we're probably going to try and limit that to 35 centimetres of water if possible, although it's not always possible. And sometimes in asthmatics, you have to use much higher pressures than what you're comfortable with just to move their chest and achieve satisfactory gases. In terms of PEEP, this is a controversial area. Some people would argue that because asthmatics struggle to get out of their lungs and have their own auto PEEP, you can actually set the PEEP at zero. Um, others would argue you should actually match their own auto PEEP on the ventilator. What I tend to do is set a low normal PEEP, somewhere around about five. If the patient's fine on that, that's good. If not, I'll try it up and down and try and find out what the individual patient in front of me actually likes. In terms of FiO2, in general, from a lung protection point of view, we do try to keep our oxygen at less than 60% if possible. And we will relax our oxygen saturation targets to either 88 or 85, depending on the individual circumstances. Obviously, this isn't going to be possible in our particular patient at the moment. We're only just about saturating, still on 100% oxygen. But it is something to think about as things continue to improve in our patient. In terms of CO2 targets, Again, with these low rates, um, you will not have a normal CO2 pattern. If you were to put a, a healthy eight-year-old on the same setting, you would expect the CO2 to rise. Um, in asthmatics, you are just about trying to get by with the ventilator. You are not trying to ventilate them to a normal gas. If you do that, you will cause air trapping. You will use higher pressures than what you need to put in the patient at risk of air leaks. So you're just about trying to get by. Um, depending on the guidelines you look at, some will allow CO2 levels all the way up to 14 kilopascals. Um, obviously, that's going to result in a very low pH. We do try to keep the pHs above somewhere around about 7.2, some would say 7.15. And to do that, you often will have to buffer the patients with some bicarb to allow the CO2s of 14 to give you acceptable pHs. So as you can see, it's not a good place to be. And if you think back to, for example, an asthmatic you've looked after before in the paediatric ward, on high flow, 40% oxygen, SATs are 92%, and somebody's thought about, should we intubate them? Remember, this is where you're taking them to. So actually, that asthmatic, as long as they're not tarring and their gas is okay, you should continue to sit on them. And that's why we recommend you pick up the phone and phone us before you decide to intubate them. Okay, so going back to reassess our patient, our airway is really on change. From a breathing point of view, we're on PRVC at 180 mils, which is about 6 mils per kilo, but only 79 mils of that is being delivered to the patient because the ventilator is ringing off at the high pressure alarm. So we're getting 35 over 5 in terms of pressures, rate of 15, IT of 1 to 3, and we've checked that middle graph on the ventilator and there's no signs of our trapping. We're still in 100% oxygen with sevofluorin in the circuit, our air entry is still poor throughout with wheeze throughout the chest. Saturations have deteriorated since going back onto the ventilator. They're down to 83% in 100% oxygen. We have doubled up the subutamol to 40 mics a minute. Aminophilin's on change. And we've also given the patient a bolus of Sodabec, repeated the magnesium load, and we've had a good check through the circuit, making sure there's no dead space. And we're happy that the particular ventilator we're using 
is appropriate for an eight-year-old. In terms of the cardiovascular system, things are better with the adrenaline running at 0.1 mics per kilo per minute. We've got a satisfactory heart rate, 142, and a MAP of 65. In terms of disability, things are mostly unchanged. The only thing that really has been done is the fentanyl has been halved. Taking a look at the blood gas after 20 minutes on the ventilator, and unfortunately it has significantly deteriorated. Our pH is down to 6.72. CO2 is up again to 19.4 kilopascals and the base excess has also deteriorated down to minus 10.6 with the lactate having risen to 6.4. Potassium continues to fall down to 3.1 so we are going to need to think about starting to concentrate a potassium infusion. So what now? What I want you to do is go over to the YouTube chat and type in what you think we should do to turn this patient around. So just while you're typing your answer in, I want to just recap on our ventilator settings. So if you haven't got your answer in, keep it coming and we'll take a look at it. So in terms of ventilation, we're on PRVC at 180 mils, about six per kilo, but only 79 mils is being delivered. We're on pressures of 35 over five, a rate of 15, IT of one to three in 100% oxygen. And I know probably what some of you are thinking, um, we've got no evidence of air trapping, so can we not drop our IT ratio to one to two? That's gonna let us lengthen our um, respiratory rate and hopefully improve our ventilation. Now that is really just touching around the edges as far as I'm concerned, and that's maybe gonna improve our pH from 6.7 to 6.9, but it is not gonna solve the underlying problem. And looking at those settings, which you can see on your screen, there is one glaring abnormality. And that is the fact that our ventilator is only delivering 79 mils, which is about two and a half mils per kilo. So if you could imagine taking a healthy eight-year-old, putting them on two and a half mils per kilo tidal volume at 15 breaths per minute, you're gonna have a terrible blood gas. And that is the reason why our patient is not oxygenating or ventilating effectively. And that is just, pressure alarms are set too low. The reason we can probably oxygenate and ventilate the patient on the bagging circuit is we're probably using much more significant pressures and making sure the patient gets the correct tidal volume in on the bagging circuit. And if you were to put a manometer on that bagging circuit, you'd probably be surprised at what the pressures you were using actually were. We always seem very happy to use high pressures on a bagging circuit, but not on a ventilator. And I have seen this uh, a number of times in real life where people will just not put the pressures up and the patient is not oxygenating or ventilating. So I don't advocate using high pressures if you can avoid it, but in this circumstance, we cannot leave the patient as they are. So what we do, we go ahead and increase the pressure limits to 50. On that, we actually are getting in about five and a half mils per kilo of tidal volume. And over the next 10 minutes, our oxygenation improves significantly. We're able to wean the oxygen down to 80%, maintaining saturations of 88%. When we repeat our blood gas, things are going the right way. Our pH is significantly improving and our CO2 is down to 12 kilopascals. At that stage, the pediatric retrieval team comes through the door and are delighted to see the patient is improving just as delighted as you are to see them coming to take over the patient. So I want to finish off by just covering what I think the key learning points are from this talk. And the first speaks for itself. Don't intubate an asthmatic unless you really must. And if you didn't understand this at the start of the talk, hopefully this case makes the reasons behind that very clear. Um, if time allows before you intubate the patient, please discuss it with PICU or the transport team, to whatever the local arrangements are in your area because we, like I said, we may well be able to actually avoid intubation by altering the patient's treatment. Um, I would strongly consider inserting an arterial line prior to intubation. Air trapping is what tends to kill these patients, and this is your best way to pick it up and treat it in a timely manner. For the patient who is peri-arrest or is actually arrested, remember air trapping, and that should be the first thing that you treat. Um, if that doesn't resolve the problem, think about attention pneumothorax. And then when you're into refractory asthma, don't just think about bronchospasm, think about increasing mucus production and the treatment options we've discussed on that. Okay, thank you for listening to me and I'll now take any questions.